Good evening, good evening, good morning. I see someone here from India. Good afternoon or late afternoon for those of you who are joining us. It's so exciting to see all the folks chiming in in the chat. Please keep the chat lively to let us know. It is hard when you are not in person, but I'm grateful to be here in virtual community with you all. My name is Novella Ford. I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, a part of the New York Public Library. I am pleased to be your MC this evening and delighted to have you join us for the opening program of the 16th National Black Writers Conference. Let's get some virtual applause going for that. This year's theme is the beautiful struggle, black writers lighting the way. Over the next three days, you will hear from an esteemed roster of writers, poets, scholars, and artists who attest to the fact that works by Black writers are testaments to the ways their texts have documented struggle and persistence, and how many of those works have provided light for overcoming obstacles and surviving in a racially constructed society. For those of you who may not know, the Schomburg Center is one of the world's leading cultural institutions devoted to the research, preservation, and exhibition of materials focused on African-American, African diaspora, and African experiences. And for the last 97 years, the Schomburg has been a champion not only of the preservation and collection of work by esteemed writers like Langston Hughes, Anne Petrie, and James Baldwin, to name a few but of the amplification of work by today's writers, scholars, and cultural historians, some of whom are being featured and honored at this year's conference. I'm proud to say that in 2019, I produced the first annual Schomburg Center Literary Festival to give back to, book, to a book-loving public what countless book festivals had given to me which included close encounters with real life writers. I mean, real life writers is how I felt about it. Free books sometimes and permission to aimlessly wander the streets, buying books and being bookish with fellow travelers. The word will always be necessary to our liberation journey. Again, thank you and congratulations to the entire team at the Center for Black Literature for gathering us this evening and for the days to come. We begin this evening's program by welcoming Chief Baba Neil Clark, a master and legendary percussionist, scholar, and educator. He will open the program with a pouring of libations, a ritual that is an offering to the spirit and memory of our ancestors. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Chief Baba Neil Clark. I lufo pejo awo ovo I'm an initiated Oloshun in the Lukumi tradition. I'm an Awo Ifa in Ishe She tradition. My chieftaincy title is from Oshogbo, Nigeria, and I'm born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. It is with these sanctions that I conduct this libation this evening. I will be doing the libation in the Lukumi dialect of Yoruba and I will be pouring libation with water, which is the staff of life. And I will be pouring libation into the earth of a potted plant, the earth upon which we all stand and depend. And with that, we begin with each one of my statements. I ask that you say Ashe as an affirmation for the invocation that I'm making. Tutu, Omi Tutu, Ele Tutu, Ano Tutu, Ona Tutu. Mojubolo de Mare, Mojubolo Joni, Mojube Lada, Mojube Lemi, Mojube de Mare, Mojubolo Rune, Mojuba Laye, Mojubolo Pressi, Mojubo Lofi, Mojuba Rina Rode, Mojubo Bobo Eda, Mojuba Ig by Edemology Cotun, Mojuba Ig by Edemology Cosi, Mojubo Kale Ni Idemo Edemole, Mojubo Oru, Mojuba Shupa, Mojuba Aye, Mojubi Ile, Mojuba On Me, Mojuba Inya. Would you buy Fefe? Would you body go Medina ye? Would you be a la room? Would you be a war room? Would you body what? Would you be a goonsu? Would you be a Rita? Would you be a goongo? Would you be a war ye and me shedunga? Would you be a lua too? Would you be a lua see? E ba ba ba. E ba ye ye. E ba lua see what you? E ba jabona can. E ba koda. E ba sheda. E ba bobo egun e delay me. E ba bobo egun bobo e nia. I've just paid homage to my ancestors and the ancestors of everyone here gathered. We will now call on the names of the ancestors of 
the Center of a Black Literature and the National Black Writers Conference. We begin with John Ali, Oliver Killens Ibaye, Adrian Kennedy Ibaye, Amy Cesaire Ibaye, Amiri Baraka Ibaye, Arturo Schomburg Ibaye, Audrey Lord Ibaye, August Wilson Ibaye, B. Smith Ibaye, Bell Hooks Ibaye, Bishop Desmond Tutu Ibaye, Calvin C. Herrington Ibaye, Carolyn Rogers Ibaye, Chadwick Boseman Ibaye, Sheikh Anta Diop Ibaye, Chief Baba Lloyd Weaver Ibaye, Chinua Achebe Ibaye, Cicely Tyson Ibaye, D.O. Fagunwa Ibaye, David Dinkins Ibaye, Derek Walcott Ibaye, Douglas Turner Ward Ibaye, Eric Jerome Dickey Ibaye, Ernest Gaines Ibaye, Fred Buford Ibaye, Glenn Ford Ibaye, Gregory Tate Ibaye, Gwendolyn Brooks Ibaye, Henry Dumas Ibaye, J.A. Rogers Ibaye, James Baldwin Ibaye, Jane Cortez Ibaye, John A. Williams Ibaye, John Lewis Ibaye, John Singleton Ibaye, June Jordan Ibaye, Kamal Braithwaite Ibaye, Camila Aisha Moon Ibaye, Catherine Dunham Ibaye, Catherine Collins Ibaye, Langston Hughes Ibaye, Lanny Guinea Ibaye, Laris Otis Graham Ibaye, Lerone Bennett Jr. Ibaye, Lorraine Hansbury Ibaye, Louis Re Reyes Rivera Ibaye, Lucille Clifton Ibaye, Maya Angelou Ibaye, Melvin Van Peebles Ibaye, Entezaki Shange Ibaye, Octavia, but Octavia Butler Ibaye, Oscar Michaud Ibaye, Asi Davis Ibaye, Usman Sembene Ibaye, Paul Carter Harrison Ibaye, Paul Marshall Ibaye, Robert P. Bob Moses Ibaye, Ruby D. Ibaye, Sidney Portier Ibaye, Steve Carter Ibaye, Tony Cade Bombada Ibaye, Tony Morrison Ibaye, Valerie Boyd Ibaye, William E. Boyd, W.E.B. Du Bois Ibaye, William Cox Ibaye, William Greaves Ibaye, Zora Neale Hurston Ibaye. As we call the names of these ancestors, as we invoke their presence today, we come, we have come a long way, and we are happy to celebrate the opening of the 16th National Black Writers Conference. Progress is our companion. We pray that the Center for Black Literature and the National Black Writers Conference will continue to grow from year to year. We pray for Dr. Green and the staff to continue and be in good health from year to year. We pray that the staff of the Center for Black Literature will be in good health and will be able to continue to work from year to year. We pray for the work, the team that worked to make this National Black Writers Conference a success. You should all be proud of yourselves on this day as we open this 16th annual National Black Writers Conference. Our ancestors have seen your work, your strength, your endurance, your patience, your tenacity, your perseverance, your commitment, and know they have been with you and will continue to be with you as you overcome and grow and succeed in the realization of the mission of the Center for Black Literature and the National Black Writers Conference. We pray for the board of directors. We pay for the advisory board. We pay for Medgar Evers, the home of the Center for Black Literature. We pay for the funders and supporters, both public and private. We pray for the elected officials for their continued support and remember us as they move forward. We pray for the participants and the attendees of this conference that they may come and participate in peace and good health they may be nourished and informed and encouraged and illuminated by their participation in this conference. We pray that through the course of these four days, everyone will come together and make sure that the National Black Writers Conference is true to the vision and the mission of its founder, John Oliver Killens, and that it will be as welcoming as any other institution in the world. 
where people may come to learn, to share. They may invite others to join in this exploration and this celebration. The ancestors, we have called on you. Know that the fire you have lit, we are tending and it still burns brightly. We thank you all for this blessing and this charge. Please keep us to not look aside to the left or to the right, but straight ahead for what the Center for Black Literature is about to do this week, this year, and on and on. We are here to stay. We need, what we need is continued commitment, collaboration, peace, coalition on all levels. We remember our ancestors and the vision they have installed in us, instilled in us, and entrusted us with. With that, I greet everyone a good evening and a good conference. Thank you very much. To Ibaneshu. Thank you so much, Chief Baba Neil Clark. I would also like to put in and say out loud, Jean Blackwell Hudson and Augusta Baker, who were black librarians so important to the Harlem community in introducing those in the community to black authors, not only of fiction and of history, but of children's book authors and really championing child, uh, diverse children books, particularly those fe featuring black uh, stories and figures. I also want to lift up the name of Eloise Greenfield and Guy Johnson, who we recently lost this year. I want to next welcome Dr. Patricia Ramsey, the sixth president of Medgar Evers College of the City University of New York. Well, thank you. Um, I bring greetings on behalf of Medgar Evers College, a college born out of advocacy of the Black citizens of the Central Brooklyn community birth with social justice in its DNA. I welcome you to the 16th National Writer, Black Writers Conference, a conference that was the vision of the late John Oliver Killens and is one of the premier events of the Center for Black Literature at Megar Evers College. Over the years, this conference has attracted a host of renowned writers and scholars like those that are participating in our conference this year. This year's conference theme, The Beautiful Struggle, Black Writers Lighting the Way, is, the, is most appropriate for the times in which we find ourselves. I want to thank Dr. Brenda Green, Mr. Reynolds, Ms. Magruder, and the entire Center for Black Literature team for their diligence and dedication to the work and for ensuring that you will have a great experience at this outstanding conference. Please enjoy the 16th annual Black Writers Conference at Mega Evers College. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. I want to take a moment to acknowledge Dr. Brenda Green, who is the director of the National Black Writers Conference and executive director and founder of the Center for, Liter for Black Literature, as well as a professor of English at Medgar Evers College. For those who may not know her background, she is a scholar, an educational leader, an author, a literary activist, and a radio host. Her educational leadership, professional accomplishments, and scholarship include essays and grants and book reviews and presentations in African-American literature, composition, and multicultural literature. And I think it's important to know about the people who introduce us to these communities that we get to participate in. And so I just wanted to acknowledge Dr. Green and thank her for all of her hard work over the years to make this center as well as make this conference uh, the gem that it is in our community. I wanna also take some time to acknowledge any elected officials and special guests, guests who may have logged on for the program. If you are an elected official, please let the folks know who you are and where and who you um, represent, whether here in New York or anywhere you are across the country or in the world. I wanna also say congratulations to this year's honorees, writer Herb Boyd, esteemed scholar Eddie S. Glaude Jr., the 22nd Poet Laureate of the United States, Tracy K. Smith, award-winning novelist Jacqueline Woodson, and poet, performance artist, and dancer, Nana Camille Yarborough. 
I hope that if you do not have any of their books that you will consider going to your local library or purchasing a book from your local independent bookstore. Uh, I promise you that there is something to be learned from each of these authors. Next, I'm gonna introduce you to award-winning poet, Nikki Finney, who will read a special selection that embodies the spirit of the conference and conversation. Thank you so much, Novella Ford. Welcome everybody. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is origin story number 962, and it's for brother Haki and for the family of black writers and black readers in the world. For the brother reading poetry to black people standing in a circle. The girl travels up south to East Orange, New Jersey to visit her daddy's people. The seabirds are still alive, is still five years away from publication. It's 1972. Angela has been acquitted of all charges and Asata Shakur is just a girl from Flushing, Queens who has not yet joined the Palinque. Black Classic Press is an institution that is coming soon. She is 15 when she makes a corner turn on Main Street and heads into Duka Ujama in East Orange, gravitating toward the bright red and black on the cover of something called Don't Cry, Scream. On the back of another broadside entitled Black Pride, there is a poet brother standing in the middle of a circle reading to black people draped in African fabric in Malcolm X Shabazz Park. Nobody has a cell phone in their hand and their eyes are watching him staying near his words. The girl from down south who is now clearly up south stands in the aisle reading through all the broadsides and soon adds a third title to her growing stack. We walk the way of the new world. She likes how the title doesn't talk down to her and moves her young feet toward the nice Northern air. She decides in that instant that Marie Evans, I am a black woman, which is staring at her on the second shelf must come home with her as well. Her daddy's people are waiting safely outside on the sidewalk, waiting for her to make her purchases. They are not too worried about her six inch Afro because after all, it is 1972 and Wantu Wazuri, you know, beautiful people use Afro sheen. But the small thin broadsides of poetry books that she keeps finding in the bodegas and the head shops up north, those thin maps made of the inner skin of trees that can fit in her shoulder bag or her overall pockets are worrisome black accelerants. These cannot be found on the metal turnstiles back home at the local Piggly Wiggly. Their toes, that family, are tapping outside on the sidewalk while she empties out all her folded dollars and change on the counter. But there are two more spaceships waiting for her. A black value system by Imamu Amiri Baraka sits to the right on the register and Dr. Chancellor Williams, the destruction of black civilization is there on the left. She has already started reading about mugwort and valerian root as natural cleansers for her young colon. And she tries hard to push away from her grandmother's garlic fried chicken in order to go back to Black Eden, the young radical classic guide to herbal medicine and natural foods. Because as the sign in Duka Ujama's window reads, baby, you are what you eat. To Disembark will be published in nine more full turns of the sun, but no matter where her feet take her, she is still a black Southern girl in East Orange gathering what the polite white folks back home in rude South Carolina don't want her to ever know that those black codes they are revising in 1972 are the same dressed up black codes from 1832. But Hoyt Fuller's introductions and preambles and forewords found at the front of the books of the brother who reads his poetry to black people standing in a circle wearing that African fabric, regal and nine feet tall, will set her sailing as she decodes their so-called black codes. So when she goes missing from the family stoop the next day and returns to Duka Ujama only to find paper sold by Carolyn Rogers and Tony Cage, the black woman, and another one called Report from Part One, 
and riot and man child in the promised land and the black light poster that reads free the New York Panther 21 that is hanging like a long sunbeam from the ceiling well. All of this will eventually lead her to Shikanta Dia, who will arrive later that summer, and Walter Rodney's blockbuster, how Europe underdeveloped Africa will start to push and guide her feet. And so now you see what the old griots say that is true. A steady drop of water, honey, will wear a hole in a rock. Kilimanjaro meets Niagara Falls, meets Little Rock, Arkansas, meets the Congaree River. There is no Facebook, no Twitter, no TikTok. There is only Jet, Ebony, Black World, Negro Digest, Nathula Journal, Open Places, and the living Black Underground Railroad Press known as Broadside Press and Third World Press. And Sister Audra and June are waiting for me farther on up the mountain pass. And it will be four years before a capsule course in Black poetry writing will be published and tight in her hands. And 10 more years will fly by before she finds and learns to hum under her breath while she is running her long legs around the track or playing basketball, muta barucas. It's no good to live in a white man country too long. All the while, Strom Thurmond refuses to mention his Black daughter in his constant tirade against Black people, and it will be 12 more years before homegirls and hand grenades lands unannounced, and the pollen of Black words swirling like a planet around her big afro will never clear. And six more years before she will sit in Dr. Gloria Wade Gale's class at Talladega College, where she will try her best to memorize all 394 pages of Stephen Henderson's understanding the new black poetry. And it will still be 36 years before Sadia Hartman's Lose Your Mother falls to earth. And 35 years before Tayemba Jess's Oleo ascends. And all of this will spin and whirl and spiderweb around her while Nina's Mississippi Goddamn and Old Baltimore plays on the eight track. And one night she will be trying to fall asleep when she hears her daddy put Miriam Makiba's Pata Pata and then click song on the RCA Victor. And she will finally realize she is not trying to escape her family in the South, but simply find her tribe, walk to her circle, even as America keeps pouring the gasoline at all their feet. She will come to understand that she is one of the 16, 19 midnight birds that Mary Helen Washington already named in 2011. That same 15-year-old girl who bought every broadside she could in Duka Ujama will win some big writing award and they will be dancing all night and Camila, Aisha Moon and Patricia and Rachel will all be there with her. And the next morning when she sleepily gets on the plane to head back to her Southland, her cell phone will ring and it will be that same brother who always likes standing in the middle of that old, old village circle in order to read his poetry to the African people wearing African clothes. Brother Haki, sister, he will say, they are coming for you now with all their golden chariots. But remember, we valued you long before yesterday and they have no idea all that you are worth. So as you head home, Haki said to me, remember to always name your price before they do. Thank you, Brother Haki, for being in the circle of my life, our lives, and always for reading to us all the stories of, oh my, how the people standing in the circle could fly. We're not worthy, but we are. Could you give us the title of that poem again? on the board. It's like, yes, I'm trying to read it. For the brother reading poetry to black people standing in a circle. <laughs> that's what he did. That's what the brother did. And that's what you just brought us. Thank you so unbelievably much for blessing us with that poem, for giving us that journey in black literature. Would you say pollen of black words? I mean, whew. That Afro that sits out here. That's what this conference is. Before, right. before the 16 years. The 16 years just organized it. Before that, Black words were pollinating. And now this is what we have in this moment. So thank you so much. Thank you. If you do not have any of Nikki Finney's work, I'm telling you, your library is bereft. 
I suggest on wings made of gauze, rice, the world is round and head off and split, which won the National Book Award for Poetry in 2011. I personally, her new collection of poems, Love Child's Hotbed of Occasional Poetry, was a book that helped me through quarantine and was a favorite of mine to give to people who love the intersection of creativity and the archives and to learn how much of a daddy's girl uh, Nikki Finney yes. is. Uh, so thank you again for blessing us with that word. Thank you, Navella. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. We have come to the part of the evening where we get to enjoy an opening keynote with Dr. Haki Aramadabuti in conversation with Dr. Keith Gilliard, moderated by Dr. Joanne Gavin. Dr. Gavin is a fellow traveler in this poetry world. I will say that I am on the board of Kave Kanam and the work that she's doing with Furious Flower Poetry Center is one to be amazed, is one to be modeled. Um, and I'm grateful that she uh, is there leading the charge, but she's also someone whose energy is infectious. Dr. Joanne Gavin is the executive director, as I mentioned, of Furious Flower Poetry Center and professor of English at James Madison University. She is author of Sterling A. Brown, Building the Black Aesthetic Tradition, and a children's book, I Bet She Called Me Sugar Plum. She is also the editor of Furious Flowering of African American Poetry, Furious Flower, African American Poetry from the Black Arts Movement to the Present, Shaping Memories, Reflections of African American Women Writers, and Furious Flower, Seeding the Future of African American Poetry with co-editor Lauren K. Aline. A dedicated teacher and scholar, Gabin has received numerous awards, including the College, including the College Language Association Creative Scholarship Award, the James Madison University Distinguished Faculty Award, and induction in the International Literary Hall of Fame. Please welcome Dr. Joanne Gabin, who will introduce us to the rest of the program. Hello, Novella. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And my word, my sister, Nikki Finney, that was fire. That was amazing, amazing. I am so happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Green, for the invitation and for all of you who have helped to put this conference together. It's wonderful. I, uh, this is my first time uh, being present at one of the conferences and I'm just so happy to be here to introduce you to two giants of black literature. First, I wanna say this is a conversation between uh, Dr. Haki Matabuti and uh, Dr. Keith Gilliard. Uh, and I want to introduce Dr. Keith Gilliard first. Um, you know, he just celebrated uh, a milestone uh, birthday. <laughs> He's saying sure. And as it turns out, he is exactly a decade younger than Dr. Haki Badabuti. And he readily acknowledges his admiration for the mentorship that the elder writer has given him. The beautiful thing about mentorship is that when you get it, you pass it on, you turn around and, and share it with someone else. I was able to listen to a tape that was done by one of his students uh, for his birthday. And it was clear that his career as a poet, a scholar, educator has deeply benefited his students whom he calls his legacy. The Gilliard crew, as they call themselves, noted that his intellectual rigor combined with his love for humanity was a mainstay for them as they pursued their studies in English and African-American uh, literature at Penn State University. Dr. Gilliard has pursued two lines of humanistic uh, inquiry, literary studies and rhetorical studies. And these interests have taken him to faculty positions at LaGuardia uh, Community College, Megar Evers College, Syracuse oh. University, and Penn State University, where he taught courses in literature, African-American studies, and civic discourse. 
He has also been active in national organizations and headed up four C's, which stands for the Conference on College Commun Composition and Communication. And he did that in the year 2000. He was also the centennial president of NCTE, the National Council of Teachers of English. A two-time recipient of the American Book Award, Dr. Gilliard has authored, edited, co-edited over 20 books, including the educational memoir, Voices of the Self. He's also written, Let's Flip the Script, an African-American discourse on language, literature, and learning. He's written on John Oliver Killens, A Life of Black Literary Activism, and on Louise Thompson Patterson, A Life of Struggle for Justice. I am grateful for uh, Dr. Gilliard's tenacity in bringing these biographies to our attention. He writes of Louise Thompson Patterson, quote, to study her story is to witness the courage, sacrifice, vision, and discipline of someone who spent decades working to achieve justice and liberation for all people. Dr. Gilliard also edited the poetry anthology, Spirit and Flame. It's a sort of heir to Black Fire, which really got me going in the late 1960s. The young man who did the tape for uh, Keith Gilliard's birthday ended it with a wonderful tribute. He said, Dr. Gilliard, what a commitment to mentorship you have been. If there is a picture of a mentor, you would be that model, full stop. We are all standing on your shoulders and in your shadow. So uh, welcome the wonderful Keith Gilliard, who is the mentor of uh, students at Penn State and other places and also has been mentored by our wonderful keynoter, Dr. Haki Marabuti, whom I will introduce now. Dr. Haki Marabuti. How you doing, Haki? <laughs> See you there. Don't make it too long, Joy. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? I'm going to make it as long as I have to, to honor you, because you need to be honored. You will know this man by what he loves. In a poet's handbook, he admonishes us, quote, never give up on love, children, good poetry, writing, music, visual art, theater, and dance. Find fresh language and avoid cliches in the same manner as you would avoid bad food and bad breath. Believe in art, Gwendolyn Brooks writes that art hurts, art urges voyages, end quote. Dr. Haki Marabuti, leading scholar, poet, publisher, editor, educator, activist, has spent his entire career loving black people and the literature we create. I can trace my own love for black literature to, to the time that I uh, read you and taught you and the other poets of the black arts movement. Since I met you in 1969 and bought the first copy of Don't Cry Scream, he has published more than 30 books, including 14 books of poetry. And he has made a profound impact on black literary tradition. His books include Black Men, Obsolete, Single, Dangerous, The American Family in Transition, Run Toward Fear, New Poems, and a Poet's Handbook, Yellow Black, The First 21 Years of a Poet's Life, a Memoir, Liberation Narratives, New and Collected Poems, Taking Bullets, Terrorism, and Black Life in 21st Century America, and Taught by Women, Poems as Resistance Language, New and Selective. Dr. Matabuti is a builder. 
of independent Black institutions, especially those that deal with books and educating children. He founded Third World Press in 1967 and Third World Press Foundation in 2002. He was the founder of the Institute of Positive Education and also New Concept School, the Betty Strabaz International Charter School, and the Barbara A. Sizemore Academy. In a recent uh, legacy seminar that we did at uh, Fur Furious Flower for hockey, I could see the joy that radiated on the faces of Haki and Dr. Carol D. Lee, his wife, when they talked about these children that they educated, that they're still educating in Chicago. He has also taken his love of knowledge into colleges and universities around the country. His distinguished teaching career includes faculty positions at Columbia College of Chicago, Cornell University, University of Illinois, Howard University, my alma mater, Morgan State University, the University of Iowa, and of course, Chicago State. At Chicago State, Dr. Matabuti founded the Gwendolyn Brooks Center for Creative Writing and, and Black Literature. He also created the annual Gwendolyn Brooks Writers Conference and was the founding director of the MFA in creative writing program. Many art institutions, schools, and organizations have returned the love and respect by honoring Dr. Matabuti with awards, prizes, lifetime achievement recognitions, and honorary doctoral degrees. That's where I have to cut it off because there's so many, I couldn't possibly talk about them all, but I would say you have been the recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships, the American Book Award, a Literary a Legacy Award from the National Black Writers Conference at Medgar Evers College, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from uh, Furious Flower. To know this man, you must understand what he loves. I was so impressed that on his birthday, his 80th birthday, he gave us a gift. He gave us a list of 80 books that we must read. <laughs> <laughs> With more gosh. than 60 years of cultural work behind him, he continues to build black institutions, continues to ensure our future by educating our children and continues to believe that art will actually save us. So we are ready for this conversation. The beautiful struggle, a conversation with Dr. Haki A. Matabuti and Dr. Keith Gilliard. And you know what? I won't have to say too much of anything else, but I will start it off by saying, in your careers as educators, as writers, as institution builders, you have experienced struggle. You might not call it a beautiful struggle, but you have experienced struggle. Think, of, think about that and, and tell us, what has that struggle been like? Uh, well, I think I'll jump in. Uh, thank you, Joanne, for the, for the introduction. I, I, I barely recognize that guy. I think, <laughs> I think you're accurate, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I recognize, recognize that guy. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you to Dr. Brenda Green, uh, obviously, as well, for keeping the vision of the 1980s at Mega Evers uh, going strong, uh, she and her staff. And I want to acknowledge uh, Steve Cannon and Arnold Kemp who were former, faculties at Meg, former faculty members at Meg Evers College, and they were co-founders of the National Black Writers Conference. So we should, always, we should always remember Steve Cannon and Arnold Kent when we gather on, on these occasions. And that poem by Nikki Finney, I don't know if she's still on, but that gave me goosebumps. It was and one of my all-time favorite uh, poets anyway, and this just, this just took it to another level. Uh, but I am deeply honored uh, to be here with Haki, the youngest 80-year-old I know. <laughs> uh, that the youngest 80 year old I've ever met. 
and I know he has some opening remarks, so I'm going to let him get to that. But I just want to express publicly uh, my deep gratitude for all the energy and support he has put into me, poured into me personally, uh, especially in, 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 in the last few years. And uh, to express my gratitude, I get to put him on the hot seat with a few questions uh, later on. Uh, but th 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 there are very few people that are as dear to my heart as uh, uh, Brother Haki. Um, I think he knows that too. So I'm going to let him open up. He has some opening remarks and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Keith and Joanne. Uh, Dr. Gabin and her husband, uh, Alexander Gabin, uh, go back to the 60s with me. And what people do not know about them is that they've been together for a long time. And <laughs> very beautiful. And they have just had a building named after them at James Madison. And the only other black persons, a black person that I know that have had a building named after them at a predominantly white institution is, is um, um, my good friend, the um, black artist. Uh, I can't think of his name now. It'll come to me. But, um, and of course, Keith, we just published Keith's new book, uh, Impressions, New and Selected Poems, um, at Third World Press. So you can go to Third World Press uh, Foundation.org and get a copy of that. And Nikki Finney, golly, uh -huh. it brought tears to my eyes, you know. And the beauty of Nikki Finney is that she does not forget. And she, she is in the lineage of the Black Arts poets and has done us proud. Uh, so thank you, uh, Sister Nitty, Nikki, and uh, please, please send me a copy of that poem. I just want to say that I believe in books. And to develop a culture and a critical mind, one must challenge the mind, just as one challenges the body, to gain and maintain health, endurance, and strength. In 1956, at the angry age and impressive, 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 age of 14, my mother asked me to go to the Detroit Public Library to check out a copy of Richard Wright's Black Boy. And I refused at first because I hated myself. I hated everything about our current living situation. And as a yellow black teenage mm -hmm. boy, the last thing I wanted to do was go to a white library and ask a white librarian for a book with black in the title by a black writer who was basically critical of white America. And so I went to the shelf and I found the book myself. You must remember we lived in 1956 and when I was went to the library, it was our apartheid America. It's not that much different now. It's just a different take on it. And my mother had a 10th grade education in Little Rock, Arkansas. And she and we moved to Detroit where she worked in the sex trade. Uh, at Sonny Wilson's nightclub in Detroit. She was a yellow black woman, prettier than sweet music from Billie Holiday and Louis Armstrong. And she was a Miss Detroit barmaid in 1955. With one of her regular customers, a middle-class black man talked to her about books and black boy was the title of the week. She wouldn't let it go and demanded when I, she came home that I go and find black boy for her. And so between Uncle Tom's children and native son, I pulled it from the shelf and went to an unpeopled section of the library and sat down and began to read. And for the first time in my young life, I was being slapped in the face mm -hmm. with every sentence and paragraph, each page and chapter I read. New ideas about Black, then Negro life, and the world we occupied attacked my young mind. I read half the book that day in the library, and at closing, I checked it out, ran home, and in the bedroom I shared with my sister completed Blackboard Black in less than 24 hours. The next day I gave the book to my mother. I looked at her in a different light. I kissed her on the cheek, thanked her, and went back to the library and checked out Uncle Tom's children and <laughs> Native Son. Now I was not completely changed, but I could not stop thinking and questioning everything after reading Native Son black boy, and then soon I picked up Wright's White Man Listen. White Man Listen 
was his first book of political and cultural essays. In it was the essay, The Literature of the Negro in the United States. And after reading and carefully studying the many black poets and writers that write reference, such as Phyllis Wheatley, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Warren Freeman, W.B. Du Bois, Claude McKay, Anna Bond Thompson, Langston Hughes, Robert Haight, Melvin B. Tolson, Sterling Brown, Sterling New Brown, Margaret Walker, Alexander Pushkin, Alexander Dumas, Chester Himes, Ralph Ellison, James Baldwin, Frank Yerby, Anne Petrie, and the brilliant poet who has become the first black poet to win the Pulitzer Prize in 1950 for Annie Allen, Gwendolyn Brooks. And so what was happening at 14 years old, I was being pushed and shoved in another direction. And so I'm going to end my brief comments by just thanking a few people who mentored me. And those persons are Richard Wright, obviously, Malcolm X, El Hodge Medigal Shabazz, Mm -hmm. Margaret and Charlie Burroughs, who were co-founders of the first Black Museum, African American Museum in the United States, Mm -hmm. which is the DuSable Museum of African American History in Chicago. Dudley Randall, who was the founder of Broadside Press, one of the finest poets we ever had in our culture, Mm -hmm. and the first poet laureate of Detroit, Michigan. Hoyt W. Fuller, who was essentially the, the, the managing editor of the major journal that chronicled all our work in the Black Arts Movement and beyond, Hoyt W. Fuller, which was Negro Digest, which we soon named Black World Magazine. Barbara Ann Sizemore, who was the first Black woman superintendent of mm-hmm. the D.C. school system. Right. He mentored me and my wife. And then, of course, my cultural mother, Gwendolyn Brooks, to whom we were family for over 33 years. And Gwendolyn Brooks, as you know, was a consultant to the Library of Congress. And after she left, then they brought in the poor lawyer name to that. I just want to say also that I'm here because of the poets that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And we brought this fire to America. And these BAM poets from Jane Cortez to Mari Evans to Amiti Baraka to Larry Neal, Sonia Sanchez, who's still kicking with us. Yes, indeed. Gaston Neal, Kalamu Yasalam, Ethers Knight, Quincy Troop, Eugene Redmond, Ishmael Reed, Lucille Clifton. And it's very important for me to say also to thank you to our current Port Laureate of the state of Illinois, Angela Jackson, and the poet that I helped mentor and help uh, bring in the first MFA program at Chicago State, Kelly Norman Ellis. And I'll end my remarks by stating that I'm here because of my wife, uh, Dr. Carol D. Lee, uh, Mama Sophia. Mm-hmm. My wife is brilliant, as most of you know. And it's one of the reasons she married me, you know. <laughs> and it's critical that mm-hmm. we understand that my wife and I have been together for over 50 years. And as Keith mentioned earlier, I pretty much stay in shape because she know I'm I'm a, I'm a vegan. I'm plant based. I've been plant based for over 42 years, and she has been the person who helped me stay alive as we built as we built these institutions: Third World Press. Institute of Positive Education, New Concept School, Betty Shabazz Academy, and Barbara Ann Sizemore Academy, and others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Haki. Haki. Uh, I would say me. that, uh, yeah, Haki wants to get everybody plant-based, but uh, he, he doesn't know. We we were at an event in Chicago once, and, and uh, Safish and I snuck over to the other side of the the room because we didn't want we didn't want Haki to see what we were getting to eat, you know. So, but it's a struggle. We're work, we're working on it, brother. Uh, one of my first introductions to Haki, maybe the first, I was in the Langston News Library uh, in New York, and I came across this "Don't Cry" screen that uh, yeah. Nikki Finney uh, referred to. In the first line of the introduction by Gwendolyn Brooks, she says, "At the hub of the new wordway is Don Lee." Mm-hmm. He was known then, and she just 
that line just uh, was set alone as a paragraph unto itself. And so that's, that made me think that the hub of the new word way, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the new word way. Why is this guy at the hub? Uh, and so that, 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 that sent me on a lifelong journey to really just follow his work and map him and track him hard uh, uh, through the years. So if you feel somebody behind you sometimes, Haki, that's me. You know, that's, that, that's my spirit on your case. But I want to talk about origins because I want to go to Yellow Black. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, I hope you don't mind me calling her Maxine, but I've read so much about her. But I, I, I think of her as Maxine, as Haki's mother. And uh, this is a memoir of his first 21 years as a poet. So I want to talk about origins because there were two things mentioned in there that, that piqued my interest because in a lot of the interviews that you've done, you've talked about your intellectual uh, beginnings as you as you did here tonight, but not so much the beginnings as a poet. And there were two things in Yellow Black that struck me. One is there's an, uh, an episode where you talk about Langston Hughes coming to Arkansas to read, and you said your mother your mother observed that, and she passed these stories on to you, and you took them as your stories. And so Langston Hughes was someone who came to Arkansas and read. And what I noticed with my critic lens is that there's a great similarity between some of the stuff in Think Black and Langston News. And I don't know that many people have made uh, that connection, especially the last poem, uh, They Are Not Ready. They Are Not Ready is, 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 is really just reads to me like a Langston News type poem. So I want to hear more about uh, origins and influences in poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was an, also another anecdote, which was funny to me when you started scribbling in high school, but you had to hide that, right? Because you couldn't be seen writing poems. And so when you got busted, you would say you were working on some lyrics for Motown groups and stuff <laughs> like that, right? So those are like the two glimpses we get into the origin of, of, of the poet as a young as a young person, high key. But I wanna know if you could develop that a little more. How, did, how was it poetry? Why was that the thing that grabbed you? Uh, because it wasn't reading Black Boy that made you a poet. It's like, what? What, what made, what, why was it poetry as your primary genre? Reading poetry primarily and mm -hmm. being a, a failed musician. Uh, I played at the trumpet. And as a result of that, looking at the connection between words and music. And doo was very, I was very close to doo being in Detroit, most certainly. Uh, but Lynx and Hughes, again, was the person, was the poet, was the writer. Um, that helped me a great deal in the early days because Keith and Joanne, I ended up in the military at 18 years old. I was six foot one, 143, 45 pounds when I went in mm -hmm. and was not supposed to actually be in the military, but it was a poor boy's answer to unemployment. And I had you know, lost my mother, I never had father really involved. And my sister was in her own life and I could not really deal with her at the level that I needed to because she's only a year and a half younger than I with her first child at 14 years old. Mm -hmm. But I ended up in East St. Louis and then St. Louis without any money, without anything, except the clothes on my back, my Martin flugelhorn. And so I went to the poor man's bank, which was the uh, pawn shop and just pawned everything I had except my clothes that I had on and then I went to join the military. And I knew that I was gonna be turned down because I'd been turned down because I tried to join the Air Force. I had a hard, I had a hard murmur. And I went to the, to, to be, I, you know, I, went, I scored off the charts in terms of the psychological and the written exam. In fact, they wanted me to go to Office of Candidate School and said I would go after basic, basic training. Well, I had to get in because I know I had this hard murmur. So I went to the, Youngest doctor I saw in the gym where they were giving the physical exams. And when the guy got to me and he measured, uh, checked my heart, I said, is, is there a problem? I said, do some push-ups. I did say, what was that? I said, well, yeah, I mean, this, I'm, I'm nervous, man. This is the first time I've been around this many white people in my life, you know. <laughs> and then, of course, I got into the military. But all I had was books. And one of the major books that influenced me early was the anthology that Langston Hughes and Anna Bontemps, you know, brought. I bought it at a secondhand bookstore. So I had that with me and I would just study and read it all the time, okay? That is what really started me at one serious level because as I would write poems in the 
in high school, I really didn't know what I was doing. But I'm, but I'm, but I'm influenced by the music. I'm influenced by the, the literature that I'm reading. So I just keep trying. I kept a notebook and so forth. But when I got into the military, the motto was hurry up and wait. And I waited with books. I waited with books. So Links and Hughes, as well as Richard Wright, as well as you know the other writers I mentioned earlier, began to feed me each day because we were in between wars. This was in between yeah. the Korean War and in between the Vietnam War. I was in the military between 1960 and 63. I came out, I did two years and 10 months and got out early to go to, to school on the GI Bill of Rights, okay? And so during that period, I would read close to a book a day because we're in between wars. And so the only thing I had to deal with was crazy white people where I'm fighting all the time. In fact, I, I got almost put out with the uh, dishonorable discharge because of fighting. And, and these are white people. These are crazy white men who think they can just say anything to you. And of course, what happened I got shipped off a of base and shipped to Fort uh, Sheridan to work with a black sergeant because nobody else wanted to be bothered with me, okay? And this black sergeant really saved my life in, in terms of at least me going. And I didn't have to deal with nobody else but him. For over a year and a half, I'm just reading and writing, reading and writing. That's, that was basically my undergraduate education. Right. And so that was it, basically. So when I got out of the military, I went straight into Black Struggle. And I went to the same community college that Gwendolyn Brooks went to, mm -hmm. which was Wilson College, Wilson Junior College in Chicago. That's where okay, I, I went. Yeah. Well, you didn't there for a moment, because that's, that's that's great, because I that's I never cool. heard before that it was the used Bon Top anthology that was so influential. So mm -hmm. that's that that's interesting to me. I'll, I'll note that. Uh, and then I want to sort of uh, uh, push the career forward on, on the poetry side. So you got with Broadside, uh, and Dudley Randall, and mm -hmm. uh, then your your career progressed from there. Could you say a little bit about that progression from Broadside to meeting Gwendolyn uh, to uh, coming onto the national stage through writers' conferences and and being the first uh, first poet in residence at an Ivy League school? Uh, no. You know, can you sort of take us through that? Well, what happened? I was stationed in the Fort Sheridan. Illinois, really just nobody to talk to. I don't know if y'all can imagine this. You're reading all this literature, all this <laughs> black literature, and there's no one to talk to. I ended up seeing this ad in the Chicago Defender about this new museum opening up in Chicago. At that time, it was the Ebony Museum of Negro History. So I went in one Saturday morning, knocked on the door, and a white man answered the door. I said, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> And so I asked for Margaret Burroughs. He said, oh yeah, come on in, young man, come on in. I walked in the kitchen. Margaret Burroughs, as you know, was a world-class visual artist. She's working on a linoleum cut, okay? She looked up and said, what do you want, young man? No, no she said, what do you want, boy? <laughs> I'm staring at her. I'm 19, 20 years old, I'm staring at her. And I said, I need to talk to somebody. But I'm staring at this woman because she is the first black woman that I ever see or meet with a natural. Mm -hmm. This is 1962. Okay. So she said, go upstairs and talk to my husband. So I go upstairs and it's a world-class library. He's sitting at the table writing and he got what I thought was water by his right arm. He said, come on in, young man. Have a seat. You want something to drink? I said, I'll take some water. He said, no, this is vodka. <laughs> All right. Now, if you know anything about me, I never drank. I never drank, never smoked because I came out of that life, all right, yeah. with my mother. And and I lost my mother at, at, at 15 years old, 16 years old. And anyway, but anyway, the point is that he was reared partially in the USSR. Charlie Burroughs spoke Russian fluently. And so he, he was the one who began to introduce me to Russian literature. So I began to, read, at 19, I'm reading Dostoevsky. He introduced me to Pushkin, okay? And at, so so the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that these people took me into another world. And what happened with the Ebony Museum of Negro History, John H. Johnson, who had started Ebony Magazine, was going to threaten to sue them if they didn't change the name. So the name was changed to the DuSable Museum 
of African American history. That's mm-hmm. how that happened. So those are two of my mentions. Now, what happened with Dudley Randall? See what happened in Broadside Press. Malcolm X, who was one of my mentors, also he was assassinated. Dudley Randall decided that we he's going to publish a tribute to Malcolm, right. but he needed some help, so he came to Chicago to get the help of Margaret Burroughs. And then I gave Dudley my poem on Malcolm, and then about a week later, I sent him my first, my second book. I had published Think Black, I think, second book, Black Pride, and uh, he uh, Dudley wrote me back. No, he called me. He said. We want to publish Black Pride, and can we also bring out Think Black? I met Gwendolyn Brooks at a church teaching the Blackstone Rangers poetry writing. Mm-hmm. We walked That's in one Saturday morning, I asked some other poets, and Gwen, all these young Black, about 15 of them, young Black uh, boys and girls, teenagers, and we sit back in the back. And when she finished, she came over to greet us, the Obasi Poets, Organization of Black American Culture. And when the poets left, I'm standing there in front of the Gwendolyn Brooks, and I, I bring out my, my book, Think Black. And Think Black had, <clears throat> now this is 1967, mm-hmm. yeah, Think Black, 1967, uh, 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 <laughs> Africa on the cover, and then Don mm-hmm. Lee. Mm-hmm. Right, I gave it to her. She took the book, Keith, put it to her heart, and said, young man, I'm going to read this tonight. Oh wow! That started uh, our relationship, and it started our relationship, my relationship with with uh, with Broadside Press, because <clears throat> basically, Dudley called me back, said, "Yeah, we we'll, we we'll reprint Think Black, and we want to publish Black Pride. Would you mind if I write the introduction? What are you gonna say? You know, now given given the given the, give the popularity though, high key." Why? I mean, you didn't have to stay. You didn't have to stay with a small independent publisher. Like, like, uh, I, there had to be temptations to or offers to 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 move on to another publisher. But what you decided yeah. you decided to stick with black independent publisher. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason was quite simple. Gwendolyn Brooks basically decided to leave Harper and Row. That's right. After in the Mecca. This was 1969, 1970. And we are meeting with the Gwendolyn Brooks Writers Conf- Writers Workshop every week at our home. Gwendolyn Brooks lived in a small wood frame home on the south side of Chicago, right around the street from Third World Press, okay? And so what happened, she showed up <laughs> at one of our meetings with a beautiful natural, okay? And the next thing you know, she said she's after In the Mecca, the last book with Harper and Rowe. He's going to leave and come to Broadside Press. Paula Gettings came to Chicago. Oh, right. This was, oh, I'm missing one important link. One of them, Brooks, was invited to the John Oliver Killen Writers Conference at Fish University in 1967. That's right. She goes down there and tells John Killens about this poet up in Chicago, Donnell Lee. John Killens invites me the next year in 68. And by that time, I got Think Black out and Black Pride out. And so I come in with fire, just like Nikki Finney gave us, gave us fire just, just a, 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 a mm-hmm. early part. No I came with fire, with fire at, 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 at Fish University. I got two job offers, one from Talladega and the other from Cornell University mm-hmm. as a result of my readings at the Fish University. And so I wanted to go to Talladega, the black school. So Dr. Catherine Hurst invited me down there, and I went. This is 1968. The white people that actually ran Talladega said, no way. We're not bringing him here, okay? So I said, okay, let me go to Cornell. Cornell's in an uproar because the students want African studies there, and they want black professors. So I go to Cornell and make the same presentation and the students say, that's what we want, okay? So what happened, I said, okay, I'll go to Cornell. But since I did not have a terminal degree, and I actually only had two years degree, the professors in the English department said, we're not gonna, no, no, we're not gonna uh, accredit this course, all right? And I said, I'm, why would I leave Chicago and come to, and I had a job, I was at Columbia College, why should I come to Cornell 
And so the students went, you know, they went black. And when they went black, the chairman of the department called me the next day, almost with tears in his eyes, said, can you come here for an interview? So they want to interview me about mm -hmm. black literature. These five top tenure track tenured mm -hmm. professors at Cornell English Department. They didn't know my history. I had read everything that had been published by black people. Everything. For two years and 10 months, that's a I got there, and the first line of question, and I'm going to make this short, was basically about Invisible Man, Native Son, and Black Boy. That was it. You want it. So I got it now. I said, look, these guys, they don't know this literature. So mm -hmm. the second round of questions, we get to the questioner next to the chair's department, and he asked me a question. And then I answered the question. Then I asked him about an uh, 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 essay in Uncle Tom's Children, okay, by Richard Wright. The guy said, you know, he, I mean, he was so full of himself. He turned about, sit back and said, young man, you mean Uncle Tom's cabin? He just to say, no, no, no. I mean, Richard Wright's Uncle Tom's Children, and I pulled the book out. Mm. The guy turned five different colors. And then the next question I'm coming from the chairman of the department, he said, basically, welcome to Cornell. Your course is accredited. Okay. Right. I can talk more and more about Cornell, but that's, that's how that started. Now, what happened while I'm at Cornell, I'm the first black writer in resident at an Ivy League university. And the writer, a writer at Ebony Magazine, whom I met at a poetry reading, when I was reading poetry with some jazz musicians in Chicago at the New Sutherland. Um, what was his name? Lawrence. Yeah, David Lorenz. David Lawrence. Yeah, yeah David Lorenz. He was at he was there while I'm reading poetry. And I read from, you know, I, these poems had not been published yet, but I, I was reading from really Don't Cry Scream. And I read this poem in the interest of black salvation. And the last three lines read, Jesus saved, Jesus saved, Jesus saved S and H green stamps. <laughs> and I heard this large howl in the rear of the room in the in, in, in this lounge. It was David Lorenz falling off his chair, cra you know, cracking up. Mm -hmm. We became close friends. He works at Johnson Publishing Company. So when I went to Cornell, he went to John H. Johnson and said, Can we do an article on Don Lee? When that was published, Don't Cry Scream came out. Now, before, you see, Black Pride, Think Black and Black Pride has sold over 55,000 copies already without any kind of national advertisement. Dudley Randall writes about this in, 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 in a recent book. But when David Lorenz published the article in the March issue of 1969 of Don L. Lee, Black, 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 mm -hmm. Don't Cry Scream hit, and it went off the shelf. It sold over 75,000 copies in less than a year. Don't Cry mm -hmm. Scream. And then after Don't Cry Scream came, uh, we walked away to the new world. And by that time, I had been to Africa. I had basically, you know, so, so that's how it happened. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so between those four books, you're talking about over 140,000 copies sold. And I'm pretty sure I was, I was one of the best-selling poets in the world at 140,000 copies. Yeah, I, I want to get, I want to get two questions in, uh, mm -hmm. so I know we've, we're running. Uh, yes. Hours just flies by, flies by so quickly. Yeah. I have two questions because your career as a poet has has, has been over uh, decades, and I wondered if you would reflect a minute about because it because it is it it has changed some over the years. Uh, you had a you you had that fire, and then it seems like it's a little more contemplative. It's not without fire, but it's a little more contemplative. The style is a little different. Uh, it's changed a little bit over the years. Other influences incorporated, I'm sure, things like that. So that's that's one thing, if you can comment on that briefly. And then the second question is, one of the things that irritates me about you, Haki, is that you always underplay being a scholar. You know, when I talk, it was like, you always say, I'm a poet, I'm not a scholar. I got about, I got about 1,500 pages here. I got an awful of books here to say, oh. You a scholar. This stuff got bibliographies and all kind of citations. I don't, and you had to read hundreds of books to do these books. So I don't really like that. I'm not a scholar stuff. So I, 
I got to bring the evidence out. Of the <laughs> like a deck of cards. He, he a scholar, so you talk about some of that too. Well, I'm not. I'm not Keith Gilliard or Joanne Gavin. All right. I, I know I can get an A woman on that. And, <laughs> As, as Sonia would say, but a but, woman. <laughs> and so I read. I'm, I'm a reader. I think that if you want to really deal with ignorance in the black community, read books. Okay. Ignorance kills. And I've always been a reader, most certainly at starting at 14 years old. And what happened, Keith and, and Joanne. My first book of uh, fic the nonfiction was from Plan to Planet. And it sold over 50,000 copies. 50,000. And we're going to bring it back out with a new introduction. Yes, Plan to Planet. And, and every place I go, you know, people would ask me, what, what about Plan to Planet, Plan to Planet? And so I'm going to bring it back up. But the point is that I could not write nonfiction without reading and without study. But as you know, most of my work, it depends upon the cultural work and the community work that we do in Chicago. Chicago is a war zone. All right, it always yeah. has been. And so one of my comments about the beautiful struggle, it has never really been beautiful to me. It has always been a struggle. When you're trying to build something, especially you know, my wife and I and others building these schools and building the press, people have got to be paid. And I can't pay them with a poem. And so even though the poetry was selling well, I felt that one, we needed, I needed to deal with prose because prose I can deal directly with this step here, that step there, this is what we need to do. Or I can recommend or even review books, which mm -hmm. I did for Black, for Negro Digest Black World Magazine. And that's how the, how the prose started. And so uh, for Planet Planet did well, what I went to Howard. See, I, le I left Cornell and I went to, um, even though I was asked to stay at Cornell, but it was just too cold and too racist in, in Ithaca, New York. So I went back and I got a position at uh, UIC, University of Illinois, uh, Chicago. And after the article appeared in, in Ebony, I got a call from Andrew Billingsley, who was the provost at Howard University. And Andy said, we're building this new institute here at Howard. Stephen Henderson, Stephen E. Henderson, the great scholar, he wants you to be the poet in residence. And would you come here and, and, and talk to us about it? I said, yeah, of course. I mean, I always, you know, I always wanted to go to, I used to lie about going to Howard, you know, trying to sell these magazines. <laughs> and so I went to Howard, came in and talked to Dr. Billingsley worked out a deal, you know, three year, you know, full professor salary, everything. And I'm in my 20s. Okay. I, I was 26, 27 when I was teaching at, uh, at, at Cornell and Columbia College. And so I'm in my 20s when I go to Howard. And I said, I will come on one condition after we worked out everything else, the other condition. I want to commute. The guy yeah. looked at me, he said, you out of your mind. You know what I'm saying? We got Sterling Brown here. We got Chancellor Williams here. We, I mean, go, he, he called and said, they live here in D.C. And you're talking about commuting between Chicago and D.C.? I said, I can't leave anymore, Doc. I just, I just can't leave anymore. We're trying to build these institutions. I got up and walked out. I walked out. Before I got out the building, the secretary called me back and said, Dr. Bills, we want to talk to you. Sir. I got back in. He said, young man, you drive a hard bargain, but I don't found some money. Okay. I found I found your regular salary, plus we got a stipend for you to travel between Chicago and DC for the next mm -hmm. three years. But you got to get an apartment here in DC, which I did. Three years turned into eight years. Yeah. Now, doing all the work that we're doing at the Institute for the Arts and Humanities that the great Stephen Henderson was building, as well as the great John Oliver Killens. Mm -hmm. who was the fiction writer in residence, and I'm the poet in residence. That's you know amazing. That? And so it, it, be, it becomes, so all that's going on. And then what happened to end this? In 1970, the great writer Paula Geddes 
came to Chicago to recruit me for Random House because Don't Cry Screen was just selling off the, off the block. So I said, Paul, I'm not going to leave Broadside Press. Gwendolyn Brooks just left Heart and Row in the Broadside Press. How are you going to leave if I even thought about leaving Broadside Press? I'm not leaving. But I said, I've never been to New York. Could you bring me to New York? And so Paula said, yes, we'll do that. We get to New York, go to, Bros go to Random House. She takes me into this office. And this woman sitting by, oh, I mean, really grand woman sitting behind the desk. And she said, Don, we waiting on you. <laughs> and I said, Tony, Tony Morrison, mm -hmm. I can't come. I can't come. I can't leave Broadside Press. And that, so this is how all what's going down at the at at that level. Um, there's so much. Yeah. I mean, during the '70s, I'm traveling to Africa. Tra I've, I'm probably the only poet who's been to four continents. Only poet who's I've been to over 38 states, read in every state in the, in the in the union. But I am the only poet with a national international say reputation who's never published a book with a white publisher. Mm -hmm. published essays and poems and stuff like that in anthologies with white people, but not my books. And Gwendolyn Brooks set the example for me, as well as um, uh, or Hort Fuller. Yeah, that, that's how I got another another national uh, presence was publishing in Negro Digest and Black World. That's right. I remember uh, that time that you introduced me to Hort Fuller, and uh, I re I remember all of the things that he did to bring. Uh, black poets to light, and you know that man needs a biography written on him, uh, an extensive one, because he really changed the face of black literature in this country. Definitely. So uh, I'm hoping some scholar will pick that up and do. There's that. one out. There, there is one out. The scholar that uh, should should have brought it to me downstairs. I don't remember. There's one out on. on There's him. one. Yeah. Yeah, but I remember you're going back and forth to uh, Howard. And my husband and I used to wonder how you did that. But also we knew that you were in, placed in Chicago because you had to keep the payroll uh, going for your, <laughs> for your employees. That, that was how it, institution building, that's the ugly side of it. How mm -hmm. do you raise the money to keep everything going? It's just not the glamor of putting out the books. And nobody, nobody's, uh, uh, committed to funding black uh, organizations, not even black people. Okay, there's a deep hatred that we have among ourselves. People don't understand that the major black ins they understand this. The major black institution of the black community is the black church or the Negro church. All right, but they don't understand that the major black business in the black community is the Negro church or the black church. Mm -hmm. You're talking about close to 100,000 Negro and black churches in, in, in this country. They're too busy fighting among each other for parishioners and trying to get whatever money they can to keep going. And then the next major black institution are black funeral homes. Okay. Yeah. So one, they're going to put you in heaven and then they're going to put you in the ground. All right. So you look at our communities and, and I write about this in my books. We're one of the few people, if not the only people in this country, we're over 50 million strong. And you have a substantial black middle class, but you look at the, that the, the homes and, and the black middle class are nice and everything, and you know look at very very efficiently put together. And but you look at the schools in the black middle class; those schools are not worth too much of anything. The high schools, the K through eight, are probably better than the high schools in black middle class uh, communities. So we have a long ways to go, and this is why I appreciate my wife so much. Because that's what she—that's the kind of work she's she is doing on a daily basis. Even now, after after retiring from uh, Northwestern University. Okay. Yeah, uh, Doctor Gilliard. Yeah. You know, we haven't talked a lot about the academy, <laughs> but uh, what are what are some of the pitfalls of of being in the academy? You've been in the academy for many many years. Uh, what are some of those struggles? Uh, yeah, I've been doing this about 42 years now. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's been different. You know, I've been to different places. You know, at Mega, at Mega Evans College, it was it was one challenge. You know, we were always sort of under siege. I think people, if, as, as the uh, the structure 
of the, the the facilities improve, I think people had people had an eye on the on on the facilities, and so we were always under siege. And uh, the New York Times, we would we would we were one of the favorite stories of the New York Times. Every time they uh, wrote about Meg Evers, they said that troubled school in Brooklyn. And I started I started thinking that was part of the name of the school. I had a dream I would come to work one day and I would see a sign. I would see a sign on the front of the building saying that that troubled school in Brooklyn, right? So. We had we had those issues, enrollment issues, because we had an open admission school and enrollment issues. We were trying to, you know, we were trying to educate people from 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 all over uh, the diaspora, you know. So you had those challenges, uh, preparation challenges, and stuff like that. So that was that was that struggle. But to me, I would say there was joy in it. You know, I mean, I kind of agree with Haiki. A lot of the stuff hey, ain't, ain't been beautiful, but there is some joy in watching some people prosper and, and blossom intellectually and move on and do some things out in the world. So you feel that, uh, no, you didn't create the revolution, uh, but in terms of people's life chances, you did make a difference to somebody uh, having the ability to, let's say, support a family and things like that. So there, there's that joy there. Uh, I've had, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just my attitude or the way I carry myself. I really haven't had a lot of trouble in the predominantly white institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, I know why I'm there. Uh, yeah. I know what I know what they expect. And so it's, it's, it's just a balancing act really is to uh, be true to myself because I'm never I'm not going to betray self. Uh, and, you know, there are bottom lines and there are things I won't do. Like I won't serve. I won't serve on the diversity committee. You know, this year they want an anti-racism anti committee. I said, well, you, you white folks work it out then. You know, let me, <laughs> let me know about anti-racist practice. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for that committee. I stay away from that kind of stuff. But uh, I've, been pretty, I've been pretty fortunate uh, at places like uh, Syracuse and Penn State. Uh, I see there are issues, there are challenges. In, in, at, uh, at Penn State, I'm the senior faculty mentor. So I'm actually putting out a lot of fires involving <laughs> other faculty members. But. Uh, I've been kind of fortunate there to be able to, uh, uh, like Haki says, taking bullets. I don't know. I dodge more bullets than I took, but sometimes you, sometimes you do take some bullets. So that's 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 kind of the way it's been for me. Yeah. But, uh, but let me say, still the be my best time in academia was still my my 14 years at Meg Evers College in Brooklyn, right there. Wow. But see, Keith, Keith is brilliant. Okay. And what people don't realize that he's actually done two books on John Oliver Killens. You know, one dealing with his rhetoric and, 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 and his language and so forth, and the other is kind of a full-blown uh, biography. And he is very subtle, but also he has this, this fire inside of him that in terms of lighting the way for not only for himself, but others. But see, when you're brilliant, you, you can't touch the guy. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's the difference there. And he's and 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 so he puts his work out. And like I say, he's a fine poet. So he's working in seven to several traditions. And when you have that, and this is the other side of it. When you function like this, you're not insecure. You're not worried about no damn job. You know what I'm saying? Tenure and everything. You got and they want to come after you, come on. You know, let's let's dance, all right? But he is he is a brilliant, brilliant scholar and poet. Yeah. Oh, Joanne. No, go yes, go on. Mary the Pillars was I was talking about. That's Mary right. Pillars had this building named after him at Virginia Commonwealth University. That, that's exactly right. So you and Alexander and Mary the Pillars last year, y'all did us proud. Got buildings named after you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to tell you, Haki, thank you for mentioning that. I'll tell you that it, it started with racism and sexism, everything in James Madison University, but it has ended well. And I'm looking right. forward, it has ended very, very well. Right. And uh, you know, but you, I stayed long enough to share with my colleagues and certainly my students kept me at James Madison University, but also my, my sisterhood. And I have to mention the right. Wintergreen women because yeah. that sisterhood kept me going because these are women all over the country who have supported me. So, I, I, you know, that poem that Nikki Finney did for you yeah, was nice. absolutely Fire. wonderful. It was brilliant. It, was it brilliant. took us back to the 
sixties, late nineteen sixties, and nineteen seventy two. Right. And I want to say to you, but there are so many people in um, 2022 who honor you both because of the work you've done mm -hmm. as builders. So I wanted to end our session. We, we didn't scratch the surface. <laughs> I didn't ask hardly any of the questions I wanted to, but I'm so glad we got those uh, questions in from you, uh, Dr. Gilliard. And you have given us a history, Haki, that is just invaluable. But I want to end our session with a poem from a book I'd like to talk about. Oh, go and ahead. And that is uh, Furious Flower, Seeding the Future of African American Poetry. Sure. And there is a poet, you all know him, Fred Joyner. Mm -hmm. He wrote this poem, and it's called To the Builders. Our hands speak the language of artifacts. Under a Saturday sun, we obey the call of our hands. The burn of builders aching in your palms, the breath of storytellers stirring in mine. We build to leave the world different than how we enter, leave evidence. A syllable is a brick, a single eked word on a page is a monument in face of the white horizon meant to erase us. Mm -hmm. you your work has eliminated the possibility that we will be erased. I thank you. Well, wait a minute. Hold, 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 hold. I thank you for your work. Wait, wait a minute. Yeah. I, need, I need to read a poem, at least one poem. Yes, you're gonna you can read a poem. We we can't end before you read a poem. <laughs> just it just be it's just six line four six lines. And All right. No, I, I, did, please. I did this poem in 1970 and it's in mm -hmm. uh it's in Plain the Plain. We we, we 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 are kind to octogenarians, so go right. go ahead. It's called Life Studies. To hate oneself and one's people is not normal. To perpetually wish to be like other people is not normal. To act against oneself and one's community is not normal. That which is normal for us as will, will never be normal for us as long as the abnormal defines what normality is. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you both so much. This Thank was you. absolutely Thank fabulous. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for what was only scratching the surface, as Dr. Gavin said, of the conversations. I'm, I'm grateful for all the conversations that I've heard uh, Dr. Matabuti participate in, even within the last year. I mean, you piece them together and you're still only getting a little bit of the story. But I want to harp on something that um, Dr. Matabuti said, which was he realized you couldn't uh, pay the bills with a poem. So I want to make sure that we mention mm -hmm. um, First, his most recent book, Taught by Women, Poems as Resistance mm -hmm. Language. Um, I saw it back there behind Dr. Matabuti, show the mm -hmm. folks, mm -hmm. but also that there is a website, thirdworldpressfoundation.org, where you can order a myriad of books by incredible Black writers. Um, Dr. Matabuti is really about institution building, um, has been forever, and these are some of the ways that you can do so. Of course, here at the conference and at the center, it's all about supporting Black literature, and this is one of the ways that you can do so. I'll also shout out the Schomburg Shop at schomburgshop.com. All of the proceeds from the Schomburg Shop supports our public programming as well. Um, and also visit places like the African American Literature Book Club at aalbc.com slash cblc. And you can find uh, the titles of participating authors of this year's conference and many other books by Black authors. Uh, thank you again, uh, Drs. Hakeem Adabuti, Dr. Gilliard, Joanne Gavin. Thank you, Nikki Finney, for that incredible poem. I mean, so I just hope folks who are listening from the center, somehow or another, we're going to be able to see another version of this, this poem out here in the world, because I think we all need it. We need it as a broadside. I want it on my wall. I know, I'm sure there are other people who would love to have it as well. Chief Bob and Neil Clark, thank you for bringing the ancestors into this place. And Dr. Patricia Ramsey, president of Medgar Evers College, thank you for your time. 
everyone who has joined us from near and far, please take time to complete the evaluation form, which was dropped into the chat as a link. It'll let us know what we're doing well, what more could we be doing, um, and also producing additional programming for you in the future. I also want to say that the 16th National Black Writers Conference is a virtual public gathering of writers, readers, scholars, literary professionals, students here in the United States and from the larger international community of artists and literature lovers. And so, as you know, this is a four day online event. Tonight was day one. Tomorrow, day two begins at 11 a.m. Again, it is virtual, so please do not show up at Medgar Evers College. We love to see you here online, I think particularly on this YouTube channel. And for more information, you can visit centerforblackliterature.org. They'll drop another link in the chat. Uh, and don't forget to register. Now, I always love to recommend a book or two. And since there was lots of conversation about the Black arts movement, um, a book that Sister Sonia Sanchez always talks about is SOS Calling All Black People, a Black arts movement reader, which was edited by Sister Sonia Sanchez, John H. Bracey, and James Smithhurst. Uh, it is one of those rare finds. We have it at the Schomburg Center. Um, and also, Dr. Matabuti, I forgot to mention, folks were asking how can they too get a hold of those 80 books that uh, you shared with the folks for your 80th birthday. Hopefully that is something that could live somewhere uh, on the conference's website. With that said, I hope everybody is feeling full from this entire meal that we've got to enjoy together in community. And I hope you will join us for the rest of the conference for the rest of the week. Have a good evening, have a good morning, have a good afternoon. Good night.